Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My, my cup, cup runneth, runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is our shepherd. With the power of a rod, God keeps evil at bay. With the crook of a staff, God guides us in the way that leads to eternal life. With loving kindness, God pursues us until we feast at his heavenly banquet. We have assembled here this evening to remember our saints, who because of their faith now reside forever at Christ's heavenly banquet. Though we grieve our human loss, by God's grace, we are able to view their deaths through the lens of hope. Indeed, we are forever blessed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, for through his dying and rising, eternal life has become a present reality. Let us therefore stand and join in singing together our opening hymn of faith this evening for all the saints.
Please be seated. As we continue our worship this evening, allow us to be in a prayer of praise and illumination. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come this evening to thank you for the saints and the soldiers and the servants that have lived among us. We come to praise all that you have been through them to us. And we ask your blessing on us as we come together to remember in our hearts, our minds, and in the deepest parts of our souls. And we thank you for allowing us to come together in thanksgiving and praise. We pray that you would open our hearts, our minds, and all that we are as we hear the word read and as we hear the word said. And so be with us in this evening. We pray this in the humble and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. From the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. I saw heaven and earth new created. Gone the first heaven, gone the first earth, gone the sea. I saw holy Jerusalem new created, descending repentant out of heaven as ready for God as a bride for her husband. I heard a voice thunder from the throne, Look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. They're his people. He's their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. All the first order of things gone. The enthroned continued, look, I'm making everything new. Write it all down, each word dependable and accurate. And then, he said, it's happened. I'm A to Z, I'm the beginning, I'm the conclusion. From water of the life well, I give freely to the thirsty. Conquerors inherit all this. I'll be God to them and they'll be sons and daughters to me. God is good, amen? amen. Before you is the annual conference choir. And I didn't do a count, but on paper there was supposed to be 100. And there are singers from all around the conference. So we're going to share three anthems with you tonight. And the first one is Grace. It's a very familiar text, a very familiar tune. I got a call about two or three weeks ago from Lauren Bissonette, who said that she has a signing ministry and asked if she could take part in this choir by signing. So she is over by the piano, and what she does is truly touching. So this is the annual conference choir. Thank you. 
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. A reading from the gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter. That same day, two of them were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them but they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, what's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? They just stood there, long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then one of them, his name was Cleopas, said, are you the one, only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened during these last few days? He said, what has happened? They said, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, he was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sent sentenced to death and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And is now the third day since it happened. But now some of our woman, women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with the story that ha they had seen a vision of angels who had said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it empty, just as the women had said. But they didn't see Jesus. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophet said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer, and only then enter into his glory. Then he started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. They came to the edge of the village where they were headed. He acted as if he were going on, but they pressed him, stay and have supper with us. It's nearly evening, the day is done. So he went in with them and here's what happened. He sat down at the table with them Taking the bread, he blessed and broke it and gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him. And then he disappeared. Back and forth they talked. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures for us? The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Let us pray. God of peace and God who is our hope. As we come together in this time of worship, remembering the saints, those beloved who have gone before us to join you in your neighborhood. God, we pray that we would be filled with your peace. We pray that your presence would be made known to us this evening. We pray, God, that your spirit would fill this place and fill each of us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now I have to tell you, I do love a good adventure. In fact, the truth is, I think that I somewhat suffer a little bit or maybe a lot from wanderlust. There's a big world out there, and I want to see it. But I also want to see it while being able to plug in my curling iron. <laughs> One thing that I appreciate when I'm traveling, at least on the highways in this country, is the usefulness of mile markers. You know, the numbers along the highway that help point us out to where we are on the road? They help measure our miles for us. I find that those mile markers help me along my journey. They let me know how much further I have to go. And I almost hate to confess this, especially with my mom and dad in our congregation this evening, but sometimes if my mind is wandering and I'm not totally paying attention to where I am, the mile markers can help me get my bearings help me know where it is that I am on the highway. The mile markers also 
depending on the situation with construction or holiday traffic or speed traps. Also, help me guess how long my journey might be. These mile markers are signposts along the journey that help guide our way. Now, having gone to high school in Gettysburg, monuments like that of the eternal peace light or of the various statues, I find they're near and dear to me. And when I'm on an adventure, I also appreciate finding monuments. There are roadside attractions that are monuments to the biggest ball of twine, which I've yet to see. And there are memorials that are monuments like in DC. And one of my favorites is to go after the sun has gone down to the FDR memorial. Now recently, a colleague was sharing with me some recollections of an illustration highlighting the difference between mile markers and monuments. Monuments usually recognize a certain period in a certain place or a certain time or a momentous occasion in a particular time or place or a particular person in history. These monuments are static. It's just from that moment in time. On the other hand, Mile markers are fluid. The numbers are constantly changing, pointing us in a direction, helping us to know where we are and how much further we have to go. So as we gather this evening in worship, I can't help but think of some of the mile markers that help to direct our journey together. Throughout our time this week of annual conference, we're focusing around this theme, Alive in Christ, together on a journey of faith. And as we gather for worship this evening, as we remember those saints, those beloveds who have gone before us, we are alive in Christ, together on a journey of faith. We are alive in Christ, even in the shadow of death. The scripture that we read from Luke profoundly underscores this. Jesus had been crucified. And three days later, these two disciples, these two followers of Jesus, were walking to Emmaus, discussing all that had happened. And as we heard Chris read the scripture, Jesus came up alongside of these two followers who did not recognize Jesus. And Jesus questions what they are discussing. So in the midst of the grief that these two Christ followers were sharing, and I imagine that they were overwhelmed with emotions, Grief and the pain and loss of their beloved, their best friend, as Eugene Peterson had said in this translation. The loss of their teacher, their Lord. I imagine that the crucifixion of Jesus had been their entire focus for these three days. And now here is this stranger on the road with them, who wonders what they're talking about so intently. I imagine that they're thinking, is there anything else other than the death of their beloved to even talk about? On the road to Emmaus, in the shadow of death, two of Jesus' followers are journeying together and totally unbeknownst to them, totally unaware, Christ is right there journeying with them. It's the same for us too, isn't it? So often, when we are so focused on those things that are happening in our lives, when we are in our own journey, and especially when we are in a journey that is wrought with grief and loss, 
we know that Christ journeys with us, but we don't always find ourselves aware knowing that Christ journeys with us. Wherever it is that we are on our journey, when so often we're in vastly different places on our journey, Christ does journey with us. We may or may not be aware of Jesus' presence, but Jesus journeys with us. I really appreciate the author Anne Lamont. I appreciate how raw and honest her memoirs and nonfiction works are. And I appreciate how profoundly flawed and human her characters are in her novels. In her memoir, Traveling Mercies, she shares her narrative of how it is that she came to faith. She talks about feeling God's presence with her, but yet she doesn't quite know exactly what that is. She talks of how she resists Jesus until ultimately she gives up and she gives in to him and opens up her life to let Jesus in. I really appreciate how she talks through her coming to faith, how she talks about where she is in her own journey. And I'd like to share that with you. Now, this is an edited version, but it still is a little bit raw and very human. So Anne Lamott writes, I didn't go to the flea market the week of my abortion. I stayed home and smoked dope and got drunk and tried to write a little and went for slow walks along the salt marsh with Pammy. On the seventh night, though very drunk and just about to take a sleeping pill, I discovered that I was bleeding heavily. Several hours later, the blood stopped flowing and I got into bed. Shaky and sad and too wild to have another drink or take a sleeping pill. I had a cigarette and turned off the light. After a while, as I lay there, I became aware of someone with me, hunkered down in the corner. And I just assumed it was my father whose presence I had felt over the years when I was frightened and alone. The feeling was so strong that I actually turned on the light for a moment to make sure no one was there. Of course, there wasn't. But after a while in the dark again, I knew beyond any doubt that it was Jesus. I felt him as surely as I feel my dog lying nearby as I write this. And I was appalled. I thought about my life and my brilliant, hilarious, progressive friends. I thought about what everyone would think of me if I became a Christian. And it seemed an utterly impossible thing that simply could not be allowed to happen. I turned to the wall and said out loud, I would rather die. I just felt him sitting there on his haunches in the corner of my sleeping loft, watching me with patience and love, and I squinched my eyes shut. But that didn't help, because that's not what I was seeing him with. Finally, I fell asleep, and in the morning, he was gone. This experience spooked me badly but I thought it was just an apparition born of fear and self-loathing and booze and loss of blood. But then everywhere I went, I had the feeling that a little cat was following me, wanting me to reach down and pick it up, wanting me to open the door and let it in. But I knew what would happen. You let a cat in one time, give it a little milk, and then it stays forever. So I tried to keep one step ahead of it, slamming my houseboat door when I entered or left. 
And one week later, when I went back to church, I was so hungover, I couldn't stand up for the songs. And this time, I stayed for the sermon, which I just thought was so ridiculous. Like someone trying to convince me of the existence of extraterrestrials. But the last song was so deep and raw and pure that I could not escape. It was as if the people were singing in between the notes, weeping and joyful at the same time. And I felt like their voices or something was rocking me in its bosom, holding me like a scared kid. And I opened up to that feeling and it washed all over me. I began to cry and left before the benediction, and I raced home and felt that little cat running along at my heels. And I walked down the dock past dozens of potted flowers under a sky as blue as one of God's own dreams. And I opened the door of my houseboat, and I stood there a minute, and then I hung my head and said, I quit. I took a long, deep breath and said out loud, all right, you can come in. So again, in our journeys of faith, so often we are in different places. Sometimes in this journey, we're not even aware of what Jesus is doing in the midst of what we're experiencing. But we are not alone. Jesus is with us. We may not be aware of Jesus' presence, but Jesus journeys with us and we are called to journey with each other. God has entrusted us to one another, to journey with each other, to bear one another's burdens, to walk the long journey together when times are difficult, to walk together when we linger in the shadow of death. Cleopas and the other disciple were walking together to Emmaus. They were commiserating. They were grieving together. They were sharing with each other. And we are to do that as well. We are called to journey together as well. Now I suspect for each of us, there are mile markers that what would represent the people who have journeyed with us when we have faced difficulties, when we have lingered in the shadow of death, and when we have grieved. This evening, we especially remember the saints with whom we have journeyed. Tonight, we honor and remember and celebrate the lives of our saints, of your saints, of our beloveds the pastors, spouses, church leaders, whom we remember this evening, are persons who have been on the journey of faith with us. These are men and women who indeed are alive in Christ because we have promise, we have hope that even in death, there is life. Even in death, there is the promise of resurrection. These men and women who we remember this evening have helped us to see Jesus and now have moved into God's neighborhood. I love the heaven imagery in Revelation. And I appreciate Eugene Peterson's language, his take on the scripture where he wrote, look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making God's home with men and women. They are God's people and God is their God. Death is gone, tears gone, crying gone, pain gone. God is making all things new. How hopeful is that for us? How hopeful that our saints 
are with God who claims them as God's very own people. And with God in heaven, there is no pain, no suffering, no sickness, and God wipes away every tear from their eyes. As I think about my own journey, there are some saints who have served as mile markers, who have pointed me along my journey, who have helped me to get my bearings, reminded me of where I was and where I was headed, and reminded me of where I was when I was lost. It's been over 20 years since my grandmother passed away. And as a kid, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother. I was her girl. And she always wore the same perfume. And so now, every so often, when I'm in the department store, and I go to the counter that carries her perfume, I'll go and I'll pick up a bottle and I'll spray it and I'll smell it. And you know what happens when I do that. I smell my grandma. When I close my eyes, it's like I'm breathing her in. I can smell her, and she is so very real and present to me. A mile marker on my journey. Now, brothers and sisters, I am certain that this evening, each of you have your own memories, your own stories, even your own scents and smells of your beloveds, of our saints. Those memories and shared experiences, those stories serve as mile markers in our journeys. As our saints have helped us, as they have helped to point us in our direction and find our way. So now in the scripture, on this journey to Emmaus, Jesus asked Cleopas and the other disciple, what has happened? And they explained that Jesus, a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by God and people, was betrayed, sentenced to death and crucified. And now, three days later, some of the women went to the tomb and Jesus' body was gone. And some of the others also went and confirmed this. Jesus' body was gone. And again, Eugene Peterson is so rich with his words. Cleopas and the other disciple don't know that they're walking with Jesus. And Jesus says to these two followers, so thick-headed, slow, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all the prophets said? And then Jesus talked with them through the scriptures. Now this takes us to another mile marker for our journey. These followers of Christ have arrived at their destination. And as hospitality protocol called for, they invited this fellow traveler, this stranger, to join them for supper. And here's what happened. Jesus sat down at the table with them. He took the bread, he blessed it, broke it, gave it to them, and in that moment at the table in the breaking of the bread, Jesus' presence was made known to them, and then Jesus disappeared. Of course, it had been Jesus walking with them, after all, didn't they feel like they were on fire when Jesus joined them in their journey and talked with them and shared the scriptures with them? So another mile marker. When we gather around the table, and I'm sure you do as well, but I have some great memories from being around the table especially being around the table with my family. For example, I was probably in late elementary school, 
And I remember my parents had just had new carpet put in the dining room. And we must have had company as we weren't in our usual seats. My big brother was across from me instead of beside me. And the candles were lit. So these are signs that maybe there was company, right? Sometime during the meal, my brother asked that I pass him a napkin. Now remember, my big brother sitting across from me, and the candles are lit. <laughs> so you know what's happening, right? I attempted to pass the napkin. I got to the flame. It caught on fire. And my dad, very practical, was saying, drop the napkin. And my mom, remember we had new carpet, <laughs> said, not on my new rug. <laughs> now, I don't remember exactly what happened, but that's a memory that will not leave my spirit, that will not leave my experience, that will not leave my memory. There was a great experience gathered around the table. More recently, there was another family gathering around table that stands out in my memory. We had all gotten together, which was hard as we got older for us to all come together at the same time. And we were called to my parents' house because we were celebrating Father's Day, Dad's birthday, all of us coming together. And I'm pretty sure that when I heard that we were getting together, the invitation was for a cookout. And when I arrived at my mom and dad's house, we were greeted with sombreros. There was a big Mylar sign that said Fiesta. The table was set with a plastic tablecloth and paper plates, and they all said Fiesta. So maybe we weren't having a cookout. Maybe we were having a Fiesta. So what would we expect? Tacos, chips and salsa? It was like a lobster bake. These memories of my family around the table breaking bread together are reminders that even at our family tables, in the breaking of bread together, Jesus' presence is made known to us. Whether we're at our family tables, our church-covered dish dinners, during our meal times here at annual conference, and when we gather around the table and break bread, Jesus' presence is made known to us. This evening, we will gather around table, and we will break bread, and we will share the cup. And in that, we are invited to open ourselves to this mile marker on our journey of experiencing Jesus' presence with us. Much like Anne Lamott felt Jesus' presence as though he were a cat trying to get into her house and into her life. Much like when I smell my grandma's perfume, I can smell my grandmother with me and feel the presence of the saints who now occupy God's neighborhood. Much like these two followers of Jesus who were on a journey together in the midst of their grief, in the very shadow of death, Jesus was present. So brothers and sisters, we are alive in Christ, together on a journey of faith. We are alive in Christ even in the very shadow of death. We are alive in Christ, journeying with Christ, even when we don't know that Jesus is the stranger who's walking alongside of us. Along our journey, there are monuments that memorialize the past, moments in time to remember, events, people to be remembered. And there are mile markers which help point our direction and point to our future. Mile markers that help us to find our way in this journey of faith. And it is my hope and prayer that this evening, as our journeys of faith continue, that we would travel together, 
finding the mile markers that point our way, drawing us closer to Christ. As we celebrate the lives of those saints who have gone before us and helped us to experience the presence of Christ and have served as mile markers in our faith journey. Because indeed, we are alive in Christ, together on a journey of faith, and we are alive in Christ, even in the shadow of death. Amen. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, our saints put on Christ. So in Christ, they now wear the clothes of glory. Tonight, we remember the service of each layperson with a Bible. Tonight, we remember the service of each pastor by placing a stole upon the oxen yoke. Let us remember now, dear friends, the names of our honored dead who have gone on to glory. Mrs. Miriam V. Bailey. Reverend Robert L. Benson. Mrs. Nicia J. Barnes. Reverend Kenneth R. Bonham. Mrs. Gloria P. Cole. Reverend Vernon, Vernon R. Eichelberger. Mrs. Betty H. Dunwoody. Reverend W. Marvin Freed. Mrs. Margaret M. Germond. Missionary Dorothy R. Gilbert. Mrs. C. Louise Hilliard. Reverend Dwight E. Giles, Sr. Mrs. Clarion L. Horst. Reverend Marjorie A. Glasgow. Mrs. Miriam T. Haratiak. Reverend Dr. Wayne L. Hepler. Mrs. Harriet Dawes LaForce.
Reverend Charles H. Leitzel, Jr. Mrs. Joyce J. Long. Reverend James E. Rudy. Mrs. Louise Geraldine Los. Reverend J. R. Shank. Mr. W. Robert Mitchell. Reverend Kermit O. Schrouder, Sr. Mrs. Eva May Nelson. Reverend Gerald D. Wagner. Mr. Kenneth H. Plummer. Reverend Maureen A. Wagner. Mrs. Irma I. Shearer. Reverend C. Wesley Wilson. Mrs. Thelma F. Shearer. Reverend Rondall I. Woodall. Mrs. Glengale M. Stevens. Mrs. Jean Ray Strimmel. Mrs. Anna Verghese. Mrs. D. Nadine Washburn. Mrs. Bettina Betty Way. Mrs. Grace P. Whitfield. Mrs. H. Jean Zeisloft. Let us pray. O God of both the living and the dead, we praise your holy name for all your servants who have faithfully lived and died. We thank you for the sacred ties that bind us to those unseen who encompass us as a cloud of witnesses. We pray that, encouraged by their example and strengthened by their fellowship, we may be diligent followers and that nothing will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The anthem, Midnight Cry, I was unfamiliar with before I came to Zion Church. But it's an anthem that I grew to love and I know that there are members of the choir that this anthem means an awful lot to them. In uh, October of 2010, my grandfather who 
until that point in his life, I'd never seen him sick a day. Um, got very ill. It only lasted a month. But uh, in that time, he got put on a ventilator, on a respirator, and uh, he told my grandmother that he wanted to be taken off of those measures. He didn't want to live that way. And uh, that was All Saints Day in 2010. And Midnight Cry happened to be the anthem that we were singing that day. Two services at 8 o'clock and 1045. And I knew that at noon of that day that they would take him off of the machines and that he would go home. And uh, this anthem means an awful lot to me. It gives me an awful lot of hope, an awful lot of peace. Uh, the instructions at the beginning are with quiet anticipation. God's word is true, and Jesus will come again.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you, towards you, and towards this broken world and give us shalom in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in thanking our conference choir one more time for their ministry? They're going to sing a benediction response, but you're going to help them. They're going to sing verse 1, they'll sing verse 2, and you'll sing verse 3. I am here, I have no microphone. So their instructions were to look at you invitingly when it's time. <laughs> It'll work. have a microphone. I'm looking at you invitingly. Let's go. Please join us. Let's go. 